Welcome to the first of two screencasts on pediatric chronic diarrhea. In this screencast, we will define chronic diarrhea and explain the importance of chronicity, illustrate key clinical features on history and physical exam used to classify diarrheal phenotype, and explain and differentiate the osmotic and secretory mechanisms of diarrhea. I will start out by pointing out that diarrhea is defined by increased frequency, consistency, or volume of bowel movements. While the World Health Organization defines diarrhea by increased frequency and consistency, applying such cutoffs wouldn't be appropriate for the infant. On the other hand, pediatric definitions based on a stool volume, usually on a gram per kilogram per day basis, are challenging to measure and say nothing about the frequency or consistency. The bottom line is that any deviation in bowel habits can arouse concern, especially an alteration in stool consistency. Similarly, setting a definition of chronic diarrhea also appears to be variable in the literature, ranging from two to four weeks most commonly cut off uh, used is two weeks. Identifying a patient with chronic diarrhea has significant clinical implications though because acute diarrhea is nearly always infectious related and generally has a self-limited course in the developed world. Meanwhile, chronic diarrhea suggests that the etiology is not self-limited and is more likely to cause malnutrition, dehydration, or other disease-specific consequences if not diagnosed and managed appropriately. As part of a thorough evaluation of pediatric onset chronic diarrhea, four main clinical features should be considered on history. First is the age of onset. Note that I have excluded congenital diarrhea as a complex group of disorders, often with neonatal onset. The most frequent cause of chronic diarrhea in infancy in the developed world is villus atrophy due to infection or a non-IgE mediated food protein allergy. Meanwhile, keep pancreatic insufficiency and cholestatic liver disease in the back of your mind, especially because pancreatic insufficient CF usually presents in the first six months. With increasing age, you only add to the differential, but relative likelihood of etiologies changes. Celiac disease and functional diarrhea are common throughout childhood, with the latter being defined as toddler's diarrhea in a less than four-year-old and irritable bowel syndrome in patients five or older. Allergy and infectious-related causes remain possible, but decline with age, particularly allergy beyond the first year of life. Isolated carbohydrate malabsorption begins at any age, with excess fructose or sorbitol a stronger consideration in toddlers, and primary lactase deficiency increasing in incidence uh, with age. Finally, IBD incidence increases throughout older childhood and adolescence. Three other features can help classify the diarrheal phenotype. Stool characteristics associated symptoms, whether they be intestinal, extra-intestinal, or constitutional. The last important one being nutritional status. Also in history, ask if the onset was associated with a recent infection or illness, antibiotic use, or additions or changes to the diet or medications. Family history is always important, and at last, a detailed physical examination is needed, including a perianal inspection. Based on the clinical presentation, patients can be classified as having either inflammatory, fatty, or watery subtypes. While there is a bit of overlap in the clinical features and etiologies, I still find this to be the most useful organization, especially when the diagnosis is unclear, because it can help narrow your differential and, and rationalize further investigations, most of which uh, can be performed without the need for consultation. Some quick caveats to note. Celiac disease and chronic infection are relatively common throughout the pediatric life cycle, so many would argue testing all patients for these. Then if you are doing a celiac screen, some would then argue to add the other blood work mentioned there potentially spare future blood draws. However, they're usually fairly low yield. Second is that watery diarrhea is unfortunately the most common and nonspecific presentation of chronic diarrhea. So if the patient also has failure to thrive, or after consideration of all the causes of watery diarrhea you don't have a cause, then you should be considering the etiologies in the other two categories. Watery diarrhea is often further subdivided clinically into secretory and osmotic subtypes, which is also useful because these are considered the two fundamental pathophysiologies for all diarrhea. This is because any cause of chronic diarrhea is ultimately related to one of these two mechanisms, or a complex blend of the two, such as the groups I've mentioned here. With this in mind, I'm going to use this as a segue into explaining these two essential mechanisms of diarrhea. To explain secretory diarrhea, we should quickly review the process of intestinal fluid handling. Fluid absorption under normal circumstances is about 98 to 99% efficient, just like in adult patients. It primarily occurs in the small intestine and at the villus tips. Water movement generally follows solute movement, namely sodium absorption and or chloride secretion. Generally, absorption of electrolytes far exceeds secretion, which explains the high efficiency of fluid absorption. Secretory diarrhea thus results whenever there is a relative shift in the balance. 
whether it be increased chloride or other anion secretion, decreased sodium absorption, or a combination of the both. There are lots of etiologies for secretory diarrhea, but all involve the pines, or paracrine immunoneural endocrine systems. For example, infections or immune-mediated inflammation, medications or conditions that increase parasympathetic input, or hormone imbalances due to an endocrinopathy or ectopic production, all feed into the pine system. Also, the presence of bile acids, free fatty acids, toxins, or medications within the lumen can promote secretion either through effects on the pine system or directly through actions on the intestinal epithelium. The system then alters its release of mediators from the associated cells, which mostly acts to increase secretion by alteration of transporter functions. These mediators, however, can also promote secretion from alterations in the intestinal epithelial permeability or effects on motility. The other important factor in intestinal fluid handling is that we are able to absorb most of what we ingest. However, in osmotic diarrhea, ingested solutes are poorly absorbed and the retention in the lumen creates an osmotic gradient that keeps water within the lumen and opposes sodium absor absorption. Carbohydrates are the most commonly ingested solutes contributing to diarrhea, and lactase deficiency is the prototypical and most common cause of osmotic diarrhea. Other solutes, like fructose and sorbitol, are absorbed poorly by a normal intestine, such that increased ingestion of these substances can lead to osmotic diarrhea. If diarrhea is purely osmotic, it is almost always benign and is manageable by finding the problem solute and removing it. Quickly distinguishing between the two mechanisms follows from the basic understanding of pathophysiology. Osmotic diarrhea is often clearly related to ingestion, so it's often increased after larger meals or after specific foods from which a common pattern emerges. Secretory diarrhea, on the other hand, is unrelated to ingestion, so should not be relieved with fasting, and the need to have a watery bowel movement will often wake the patient up from sleep. This type of diarrhea is often more profuse because of its persistence, and the high fluid and salt losses can put patients at higher risk for dehydration, acidosis, and other electrolyte disturbances. When osmotic diarrhea is related to carbohydrate malabsorption, bacteria in the colon ferment this, with increased gas production explaining some of the discomfort associated with the diarrhea postprandially, while the resulting acidic stools can be very irritating to perianal skin, causing a diaper dermatitis. And labs calculating the stool osmotic gap can help separate the two. Because sodium and potassium are the main cations in stool and stool is electroneutral, doubling the sum of their concentrations will give you an approximation of all the ions in the stool. This value is then subtracted from the stool osmolarity, which should equal the serum osmolarity of 290. The result is your stool osmotic gap, which estimates the number or amount of unmeasured osmoles in the stool. In osmotic diarrhea, there's a stool osmotic gap that is very high, and the pH is often less than or equal to 5.5 in the case of carbohydrate malabsorption. Meanwhile, secretory diarrhea usually has a low stool osmotic gap and often a high stool sodium. While osmotic and secretory mechanisms are important to understand, many causes still include both. We will use the three clinical phenotypes in Screencast 2 to sort through this clinical challenge.